Support the Amigos podcast and keep the Amiga goodness flowing for just a dollar a month. Visit our page at patreon.com slash Amigos podcast. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Amigos, the podcast about everything Amiga. Amigos is a proud member of the Throwback Network, your home for quality retro podcasts. And now, here are your hosts, Aaron Dowdy and John Bodokar Schaller. Welcome to episode one of Amigos, the Amiga podcast. Uh, my name is John Schaller, and I'm joined by my co host, Aaron Dowdy. How's it going? And uh, we're going to talk about Hybris this week. Uh, but before we get into Hybris, we're going to do a couple other segments. We're going to start things off with some Amiga news. Amiga news. Uh, the first Amiga news I wanted to get your thoughts on, Aaron, All right. is uh, there is a new book uh, about the Amiga out, and it's called Commodore Amiga, a Visual Compendium. Um, now, this is a hardback book, and it uh, is very big. It's 400 pages, so we're talking about a massive, weighty tome. <laughs> um, and it is a visual compendium in that the pages are all just gigantic screenshots. And uh, there might be a little blurb, you know, from a programmer or, you know, one of the, the luminaries in the Amiga world. Um, that takes up maybe, you know, an eighth of a page or something like that. But by and large, it's just huge screenshots. And uh, so, you know, this book is 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 massive, but it's not cheap. It's almost 50 bucks. It's 30 pounds. Um, do you think there's any value in having a big Amiga book like that? Oh, absolutely. Now, is this the book that was, they had a Kickstarter on? Today? Yes. And these cats also did a C64 book last right. year. Right, right. Uh, the C64 book I saw... Uh, some internals, you know, some shots of. It was very nice. I'm not, uh, I'm not a C64 guy. I mean, I like the C64, but uh, I like, I like what I saw. Now, the Amiga book. I saw a few pages out of it. It looked awesome. I would buy it if I had. Well, fifty pounds is what is that about seventy-five uh, bucks? No, it's thirty pounds. Oh, it's so, thirty pounds. Yeah, so it's about fifty bucks. Forty-five, that's, fifty bucks. It's a coffee table book. That's about right. Yeah. You know, all things considered, that's a pretty good price. I would be very interested in it. If I saw it, I'd pick one up. I like screenshots. I'm a old, crusty fellow that likes to look at old, crusty screenshots. <laughs> so, But I know those guys, the photography was excellent. So I think there's a market for it. There's certainly a market in, in the UK for it. Yeah, that's true. You know, um, Retro think, Gamer, you know, the Retro Gamer magazine has probably some of the finest quality paper layout everything i don't know what it is about american magazines but they've always seemed to lag behind their uk counterparts you know, and I, that is a great magazine and i think i think uh one of the cats that's behind that uh that amiga book uh is from uh their their the retro asylum oh I really think, i'm pretty sure that one of the guys that well i think he did that one of the guys also was involved in the c64 book and i think he's one of the retro asylum guys oh cool. so which I, I love those guys but uh good book i'm sure it'll be good and uh I wish it would come over here, but yeah. yeah. Uh, if you do want to order that, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, and uh, it's available from funstock.co.uk. Um, this next story is uh, one that seems like there's a lot of these kind of Kickstarters going around, like all of a sudden, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's uh, you know wider availability of, of these injection molds or what, but there's a new uh, Amiga 1200 housing, pro housing project Kickstarter uh, where they're actually remaking the casing for the Amiga 1200. So I guess uh, the 1200, like a lot of, you know, boxes from that era suffers from yellowing and, uh, you know, brittleness and stuff like that. So what they're doing, though, is they're not just making a new shell that's exactly like the old one, but they're making different size ports. I guess a lot of people have taken their 1200 and added like a compact flash card uh, reader, uh, HDMI out, stuff like that. 
And uh, yeah, I was as surprised as you when I heard that. HDMI, you say, that's baffling. Yeah, but uh, so this this new uh, this new case is going to have space, you know, slots cut out for all that stuff in just the right places. And what I thought was cool that I didn't know about the twelve hundred is it actually has an LCD screen or yeah, LCD screen on the keyboard. Have you seen that before? I have. Uh, I can. That's a good idea. Uh, I, I'd wager they'll charge a few bucks for these, but there's definitely a market for it my 1200 has a compact flash card in it uh which a lot of people do on the ide port and uh boy it'd be nice to have an external uh port in the case to where i can mount that on there so i could actually pull the compact flash out and put other ones in that would be outstanding because right now i have to disassemble it to paint the butt i've seen other guys that have uh uh you know floppy emulator you know cards and digital screens that tell you when the uh, when the drive's running, which is there is no drive, it, it, you know, it, it'll tell you, the it'll give you the loading stuff. And they're pretty neat. Uh, it's a good idea if they if they don't go bananas in the price. And I think it's about 60, 70 bucks right See, that, now on the Kickstarter. That's not bad. Now, what's a new, or not a new, but what's a 1200 go for just, you know, these days online, you think? Holy smokes. I, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you something. The second I got mine, I stopped looking. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very fortunate that I was gifted my 1200 and I had been looking. Uh, but uh, honestly, I would not be surprised if they're going for $500. Wow. But I mean, they, I could be way off. It'd be three, but mm -hmm. uh, they don't but make these them. Aren't, no these more. aren't $100 computers. No, that's the thing. So $60, $70 case for, mm -hmm. for especially a, a one that's been modified to the degree where they've got a screen stuff. Uh, you're you're going to pay top dollar for one of those. Yeah. Now, was the 1200 the only model that had that LCD screen embedded in the keyboard? Well, that's none of them had that actually. That so what, whatever whatever you're talking about is something that's been that's a, that's an additional modification. There was they didn't have an LCD panel in them. Really? No. Th so whatever you looked at must have been something that had someone had modified. Huh. Okay. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, they, that, that was an additional. In fact, I think now again, I, I'm not on top of the. All the uh, modifications, it's, it's all European. There's no one selling it over here. You have to import it. But I, I've dipped my toe in the pool and uh, seen some people that have put those LCD panels on the, on there. And I think it's, I think there's a, it's part of an over, like, I think like a floppy emulator card you can get. I think that's a, a additional benefit that you can hook up an LCD screen to oh, it. Okay. But don't hold me to that. Yeah, that sounds right. Because there were all kinds of readouts and stuff on there. Yeah, and it, it, I think it's, it tell, they'll tell you the, uh, the percentage of, the, of what's loaded, it'll it'll give you information of, you know, about the, what what you would normally hear, I guess, if a disk drive was spinning. Yeah, like that. and uh, these are available in all different colors. Uh, the coolest one, I think, is the transparent one. I think if I was going to have one, that would be the one that I want, just because it's neat to look inside and see the uh, the working innards of any machine. Yeah, that would be neat. I, I'm wagering also that LCD panel probably gives you memory information, mm -hmm. which is pretty sort of vital on the Amiga. So mm -hmm. that wouldn't surprise me either if it was something along those lines. It seems like I seems like there are programs out to support that that it'll I don't know if they let you set up what you want or something like that, but it seems like I've seen that. Did you have to do a lot of memory management, you know, with applications and stuff on the Amiga like you had to with like OS nine, you know, in the old Mac days? The Amiga memory conundrum, that's a show in itself. I mean the the uh You've got to consider that Amiga stayed backwards compatible for the most part through its entire run, mm -hmm. and that's through different chipsets. Then you had uh, what was called fast memory, and you had chip memory, and then uh, you had certain applications or games that require some of one or some of the other. Some wouldn't run if you had some of, of, of if you had fast memory, it wouldn't. It didn't like it. Uh, the Amiga, it's a cr it's crazy. The memory stuff is. It's not like the PC where you could go in with like QM and stuff and and change the the amount of memory or change how it's allocated. In the Amiga, you just either had the chip RAM or fast RAM, or you did not have the chip RAM or fast RAM. There was no there was no in between. <laughs> um, well, you know that sounds naughty. You don't think that uh, you know putting a new case on an old computer is going to do anything to its collectability or value down the road, do you? Tough question. I'd say, I'd say if you're putting a new case on it to accommodate yourself, I'd say that's okay. I don't think, I, in all honesty, it would probably would enhance the value at this point. That's I, what I was thinking. You know, I, I can see both sides, but on, on the Amiga, especially with the amount of uh, new 
boards and whatnot being developed for the, some of them, some of the machines that really could use those additional ports. It's it's a good idea. It's much cleaner, mm-hmm. you know, than you would have with the old case. Plus, you're not cutting into those old the old cases. And right. So those are stashed, and you've yeah. got those to fall back on. Exactly, because I mean, nothing nothing would be worse than going in there with a Dremel and really doing some damage to a you know a, an old yeah. case if you could just take that off and put it away somewhere. Because I, I modified my CD32 with a with a switch. And I was it was killing me to whether I should dig into this thing just to mount the switch, and it, I eventually just put the switch inside of it <laughs> and just didn't do it because I couldn't bring myself to bring it something to cut it. You know? Yeah. So that's a that's a little bit of a Amiga news for this week, um, and uh, I guess the biggest piece of Amiga news is that uh, this is our our first podcast, and uh, it just by happenstance we I promise we didn't plan this, but nope. this is also the thirtieth anniversary. Of the Amiga to the day, uh, so it's uh, you know I'm sure that there are all kinds of online celebrations going on on all the Amiga boards today, and uh, you know one thing that I thought was interesting is that a couple of days ago on Facebook I saw a story of a school system that bought an Amiga new 30 years ago, and uh, they just now decommissioned it. Did you see that? I sent that to you on Facebook. I, I did. I did catch a glimpse of it. Uh, I'm not surprised. The Amiga, due to its uh, the the way you could use Chroma key stuff, Chroma technology, you could use it on uh, uh, television, video type type stuff. They ran stuff for a long time. Uh, they. I'm not surprised. I know for a fact. Uh, Shane Armand Rowe mentioned on his podcast a couple years ago that they were still using them at a uh, tourist uh, destination out in like Arizona or something like that, that one of the kiosks. Mm-hmm. And uh, for a long time, they ran the uh, preview channels on your television. They ran that stuff forever. So it doesn't surprise me that they just took one out. And they're, and they're durable, obviously, because we're still using them. Yeah. Now, I don't think that the... Uh, I think it was an Amiga 2000, so I don't think it was the very first Amiga model, but... Uh, you know, the 2000 just came a couple of years after that first one. And, and, and they're very similar. I mm-hmm. mean, so uh, uh, the uh, the video, the, the basic video didn't change in terms of what you could do with the Chroma and stuff. So it, that doesn't surprise me. The 2000 is a, a, is a bigger machine than 1000, but uh, it's not really all that much different. Mm-hmm. So kudos to uh, Amiga for producing a machine that is uh, still alive and kicking with you know that they haven't really been doing any sort of maintenance on you know school systems. They buy a computer and they set it up in a room and they just let it go. So if, if only Commodore had that much longevity. <laughs> so uh, that concludes the news segment this week. Uh, let's move on to hardware. So this week's hardware is the Amiga One Thousand, uh, and Aaron is going to tell us a little bit about the history of the Amiga One Thousand. Sure. Uh, for starters, the the Amiga 1000 was the first Amiga I ever owned. It was a uh, uh, I don't know coming off the PC, it it, it looked like a pretty uh, PC ish machine. It had a, an it's a, it was the Amiga with an external keyboard, which is nice. Uh, the uh, keyboard plugged in with a well, almost like a telephone jack, which I always thought was kind of strange. So this is like a pizza box style machine right where you've got the box and then you've got a cord that the keyboard's attached to or is it an all-in-one it's a it's it's a pizza box okay. style okay. in fact there's a little like in fact a lot of people call it a, a, a keyboard garage there's a the front of the of the of the amiga had a little opening it had stood on these tiny little legs and mm-hmm. you could shove the keyboard up under it. oh really yeah. so it could be self-contained if you were going to transport it or something well it didn't stay there it's uh, just it was just an empty slot okay. that you could shove the show the keyboard uh as as we mentioned earlier in the show uh, the amiga was released um, July twenty third, nineteen eighty five. They had a they had a gala event in New York. Uh, they had um, uh, at, it was at the uh, Lincoln Center. It was a big deal, sorta. Andy Warhol was there. Debbie Harry was there at launch, which I thought was kind of neat. I don't know who Debbie Harry is. I'm not gonna lie to you. You're kidding me. Well, they were I, Blondie. I was, I was four years old. Blondie. I know Blondie. That's her. Okay. All right. Why? Why? You know who Andy Warhol is, right? Yeah, I know who Andy Warhol is. He was a big Mac guy too. He was just kind of whoring himself out. To well, all the you know, what he did. it was. I will say the, the Amiga was. Uh, they were trying to get artists on board, and yeah. it wasn't. It's an artist, especially for music. It was an artist, an artist machine. You know, t- today I watched the very first Amiga commercial. Have you ever seen this? I don't know. It's very uh, 1984 inspired, like the Apple commercial. 
Um, instead of having, you know, this lady with a hammer running through halls, you've got an old man kind of exploring this, looks like a museum with no nothing in it. And then he approaches the computer. And just like the Apple commercial, they show you absolutely nothing about the computer itself, but he just looks at the computer and the rays shoot out. Have you seen that one before? I, I don't think I've seen it. Oh, it's it's uh, it's very, you can tell that, you know, where where we were at in terms of advertising. At well, that time. I'll tell you, Commodore made some of the worst commercials. <laughs> they were just god awful. And uh, so I'm not, that doesn't sound that good, <laughs> to, be, to be honest with you. Um, the, uh, the 1,000 launch price, Twelve hundred ninety-five bucks. Uh, the uh, monitor you get a thirteen-inch monitor with it, three hundred bucks. Monitor was a good choice. Uh, when the thing went in these interlace modes, you get a lot of flicker on a on a television. The monitor does a good job. Still got a monitor. Uh, the monitor is has blown up, but uh, work in progress. Uh, the uh, it shipped with uh, Amiga Basic by Microsoft. Kind of wacky. It was Microsoft, it was one of their things they were doing back then, was make, they were doing all the basics. Hmm. Um, the, uh, the, it was a uh, Motorola 68000 processor. In uh, America, the NTSC, there was a PAL version, NTSC, we'll talk about the NTSC version. You were running at uh, 7.14 megahertz. Uh, it had a, uh, it, it, could, it had 256K of memory out of the gate. Now, for a PC, you know, at that time, kind of an entry-level PC, was that kind of, you know, the same level that you were getting, or was it above that? I'd say, I recall for the longest time that the PCs that I had, you were, you were looking at about 64K, then you would go up to like 128. 256, that was probably a, a pretty hefty in the day. I'll be honest with you, I can't remember exactly what I had. I don't think I had anywhere near that much to be completely honest. Well, I was just thinking about, you know, the the, the eight bit Atari computers. You know, you're oh, yeah, you're, you're talking about sixty four K yeah, max. You yeah. Know. Uh, the uh, I think my PC I I know eventually they worked up to six hundred forty K and it wasn't too far down the line. So I'd say eventually but the thing about it is no one with an Amiga you ask anyone that had an Amiga one thousand and none of them stuck with two hundred fifty six K. What everyone did was took advantage of the, uh, well, I used to call it the, uh, it was the front slot. There, uh, there was an, an expansion port on the front of the Amiga. You pop it off, and it was, all it took was a uh, 256K uh, expansion, and also it would give you, and the expansion would give you a real-time clock, which the Amiga 1000 didn't have. Oh. Uh, pretty important. Yeah, and, yeah. And that would bring you up to 512K. 512K was the Amiga standard for almost forever i mean you could run all, probably at least 75 percent of the software ever released on the amiga with that much memory um the uh the amiga 1000 could actually accommodate a 6810 processor if you wanted to uh, this would give you a slight bump in speed uh, i had one and i hated it because every time something didn't work I could always blame it on that processor because there, it created slight incompatibilities. It used to drive me nuts. But it was supposed to give you a slight bump of speed. I don't think I ever saw bump one. Mm -hmm. Who could tell? And you're talking, I think the bump was, I mean, it was minuscule. Less than, I think it was less than a, a megahertz of speed. Mm -hmm. It was real low. Um, the, uh, the 1000 had an 86 pin expansion slot on the side. The 1000 had a, uh, uh, a bunch of different, you know, crazy stuff that you plugged in there. Not as much as the 500, but it was mostly memory uh, expansion, SCSI hard drive expansion. Uh, I'd say those are the two most often uh, made items for it. There'd be some other crazy stuff. So there was no, didn't come with any hard drive out of the box. No, <laughs> no. But then again, my PC didn't have one either, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day. The hard drives were incredibly expensive mm -hmm. it did come with an 880k uh, floppy drive the amiga floppy drive which is mounted on the front unlike the 500 it was it was actually a lot easier to get to uh the uh the, the floppy drives could read pc discs if you use the right piece of software and this is still these are three and a half inch yeah three yeah. and a half inch they're right out of the gate they never had the five and a quarter discs you know it seems to me that they had that you could get an external five and a quarter, but I, don't hold me to that. It seemed, I think I saw that you could at mm -hmm. one point. 
Um, something else, uh, only the 1,000. Now, this is pretty wacky. Uh, the uh, the operating system was was buggy. Right? So Commodore decided to release the operating system uh, on the on a disk. So the in, the uh, the computer when you boot it up, it just if you don't have a disk and it, it just comes up and says insert boot disk. Right, it's like an old Mac. It's, yeah, but I mean, it's, the difference is well, I don't know, maybe the Mac's the same way. You had the first thing you had to do was insert the Kickstart disk every mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. The the I believe the first Kickstart I ever had was one point two. The the prominent one was one point three. So you were basically you were loading the operating system. The first thing you had to do was load the operating system Correct. into memory. Yeah. If you did not have your Kickstart disk, you could do nothing. Mm -hmm. You could play nothing. You it, it was a paperweight. Mm -hmm. So I remember holding those uh, Kickstart discs. Uh, very gingerly, <laughs> and then having a couple extra standing by. Mm -hmm. Because if you lost, if, like if you lost it or if it went bad, you're screwed. You've got to find someone that's got one uh, to uh, to to uh, give to give you a copy. Um, the Amiga could do 16 colors at 640 by 400, not bad. At at uh, 320 by 200, you get 4,096 colors. Uh, it had four channel stereo sound, which was through the through the moon back in those yeah. days. Um, the uh, the sound was just awesome. It had standard standard uh, RCA jacks on the back, and uh, you couldn't beat it. I mean, it was it was, and it still holds up. I mean, mm -hmm. the music sounds it's just quite good. Um, <coughs> the the uh, one thousand had what's called the original chipset. Uh, it had uh, different chips to perform different tasks. That's, I mean, it ran at only seven point one four megahertz, so. Having pro different processes to take over different tasks basically gave it a, a, a speed boost. Uh, you have the Agnes, which is the main control chip in, on the uh, motherboard. Uh, it held, it did your memory stuff. It, it did a lot of routing. It was the main chip, you know, aside from the process. It handled the processors. Uh, the uh, you had the Denise, which was the video processor. Uh, it did all the video stuff. And then you had your Paula, which was your audio uh, processor. Now I always thought that uh, these, you know, in, on the Atari, a lot of their chips are named after like chicks in the office, mm -hmm, right. stuff like that. That's what I always thought the Amiga was. Not, not in this case. I guess I'm an idiot. Uh, the Agnes uh, gets its name Address Generator Unit. Oh, so it's, a, it's yeah. an acronym. And then the Denise Display Enabled. That's what that is. Okay. Paula Ports Audio and UART. Okay. And but at, but. The, uh, I mean, they had to cheat a little bit. It was but, mentioned yeah. <laughs> in a couple of places I checked that the, Paula happened to be the designer's girlfriend's name. Oh, okay. So he may have worked that out. Now, right. uh, the Amiga was codenamed Lorraine during its development, uh, the 1000, which at that time was just called the Amiga. It was mm -hmm. the Amiga. And Lorraine was the name of the uh, the company president's wife. Oh. So that was... that was That's a good way to get in with the boss. Yeah. Um, Commodore... Uh, Picked up the Amiga after it was essentially done, and there's a whole you could do a whole different thing on how that went down. But originally, uh, Amiga was a, a joystick company uh, called High Toro, and they made I think their claim to fame was they made a thing called like a joy board. It was kind of a wacky thing you put your feet on to control games, but they were basically using the joystick company as a cover. So because apparently back in the day. Uh, Industrial espionage was a real big deal when it comes to computer uh, manufacturers, and so they were trying to keep it secret. So that was sort of a cover for what they were doing. But uh, uh, their, the fruit of their efforts was the 1000. The 1000, to, to finish off, has one really interesting feature. It has, uh, if you pop the cover off of it, I don't know if they all have this, but we always call them the signature edition. I don't, I'm don't. i assuming, I've never seen one that didn't have it. But on the inside cover is scrawled everyone's that worked on its name. They they signed it effectively and and then they molded around so the signatures are, are raised and uh, if you if you look closely uh, Jay Miner's name was on there from Atari he was the lead engineer for a while and also his dog ha has a paw print on there his dog is Mitchie and so <laughs> Mitchie's got Mitchie's also immortalized on there so um, you know obviously this was the most advanced machine you know graphically out at the time. I mean, I don't think you could argue that, right? Oh, it was, it was definitely uh, graphically audio. Yeah. So did it, I mean, was it just the same thing that 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 really you know 
killed so many machines? You know, was it just a lack of software support from the beginning that, that you know, was it a, a lack of business? So what killed the Amiga, and, and, we're, and we're skipping forward uh, a, a few ticks here, but what killed them was god-awful management. Uh, the, the Commodore was, I remember watching the, the thing go down, and I remember the right when I knew they were in big trouble, which just one year I saw the top paid executives in the computer business for that year, and a couple of them were from Amiga, and they're from Commodore, and Amiga was not exactly firing all cylinders at that point. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot has been made about that. I agree. The bad bad management, bad advertising. If, if you'll consider the, the last year that they sold the Amiga 1200, I think it sold like 100,000 units or 200,000 units, which, and they, they couldn't, they couldn't even fill orders. Mm-hmm. They just, it was a disaster, you know, and so they killed themselves. But let's let's not let's not go that far into the future. What I was trying to ask was, you know, obviously the Amiga One Thousand was the first one, right? And so it had to have sold well enough to spur on these other these other machines. But you know, what was it? What what do you think hurt the Amiga right out of the gate? It's a good question. I uh, when I was researching this segment, I I tried to find sales numbers for the One Thousand. Mm-hmm. Right? No one's got them. Uh, I saw sales numbers for every Amiga ever made, mm-hmm. you know, guesses. But who can tell the percentage of that that was the, that the one thousand made up? I'm guessing that. Well, I mean, the Amiga did great in Europe. It was it was it was a big time computer. In America, it started out okay. I I think possibly it was perceived as a game machine. That's you know, and the PC was your was your business machine and the Amiga was the fun machine. That's not good to get picked up when, you know, in a business world. Right. You know, I think lack of good, uh, I mean, business did they, software. Did they have a Lotus? Did they have a busy calc? Did they have anything like that? They had, they had some things. They did not have those. Uh, they had, you know, they didn't have enough in the biz on the business app side mm-hmm. at first. Uh, eventually they would get some very good stuff. But uh, it took a while. Yeah. And and if you look at 1985, what were people using their computers for? Really, they weren't even playing any games on them. I mean, I had a PC. I played games on them, but I was a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, your average person is, you know, typing in reports and using the word processor and, and spreadsheets and whatnot. So I think that's why they didn't get, get a good foothold here was, you know, at first. Could the, did, the, uh, did the Amiga have the capability of running that software? Oh, yeah. It just it did. Uh, it's 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 strange that no one stepped forward, and it wasn't very well supported by any of the big manufacturers. I'm not sure they wanted it to succeed. I'm not sure they wanted to, you know, go back and make another version of their software. You know, who knows? Right. It's interesting. Well, we'll have uh, more to talk about uh, Amiga as a company as we kind of march through history. But uh, let's go ahead and move on to our game of the week. Amigo's game of the week. So this week's game of the week is Hybris. Uh, Hybris is a vertical scrolling sci-fi shoot 'em up for one player. Uh, it was published in 1989 by Discovery Software. Uh, Discovery was not around for a long time. From what I can tell, they were around for about two years. Um, they published uh, just a couple games, and I got this information from uh, Lemon Amiga. Uh, Great site. Yeah, I mean, just fantastic. If you want to know anything about the Amiga, that is the place to go. Uh, they did the port of the arcade game Arkanoid. That came out in 87. Uh, they put out a another game after Hybris called Sword of Sodan. Great game. 1989. We I might, like it. Anyway. We might cover that one in a couple weeks. And then they also did a game that I never heard of called Zoom. Are you familiar with Zoom? You know, I, yeah, I, I think I had a look at it. Mm-hmm. I don't remember anything about it. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about Zoom either. But those were the, the games that I could find that were published by Discovery Software. Um, as far as the coding and the, the actual creation of the game, uh, this was a three-man team. It was programmed by uh, Martin Peterson. Uh, graphics were by, here we go, Torben Bakager Larson. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> and music was by Paul Van Der Valk. So, um I'm guessing, I think that this is, uh, these guys are Swedish, 
Is that right? Did you write that down? I, mean, I don't know where they're from, to be honest um, with you. That could be totally wrong. So uh, just forget I said it. Um, Martin Peterson went on to program uh, Battle Squadron, which was a, another shooter that was later ported to the Genesis. I think it was uh, a, a little bit more well known than, than Hybris. I'd heard of Battle Squadron. Yeah, before. it was fun. I like that one as well. Um, just a couple, a uh, couple other things about our friend Martin. Uh, I found a, an interview with him, pretty recent interview uh, with him on a site called CodeTapper.com. Um, and uh, they asked, well, who came up with the name Hybris? And uh, it was actually the the, uh, the guy who did Sword of, uh, Sword of Sodan came up with the name. And he said that he'd heard the word in ancient history in high school, and it means to be over courageous. So uh, that seems to fit well, you know, with a with shoot 'em up. Uh, he he developed uh, Hybris in less than a year, from beginning to end. And get this, he was 16 years old when he wow. wrote Hybris. No kidding. So uh, this was one of those. I mean, you hear about these stories all the time about these guys in Europe, especially in Europe. They're they're bedroom programmers. You know, they're living with their parents. They're going to school, and at night they're up all night coding games and and making making money. Um, so. Uh, he uh, he did. It's just incredible that you know, 16 years old, he's already making basically you know what's regarded as one of the best vertical shoot 'em ups for the platform. Um, so uh, at the beginning of the game, there are a couple things on the title screen that I wanted to ask you about. All right. So at the beginning of the game, you can choose between JP Maverick or K Lovett as your pilot. Now I couldn't tell any difference between these two pilots. <laughs> And I looked, I, I, I actually tried to see if there was a difference. I didn't see anyone that had that ever mentioned that there was. I mean, one's a guy, one's a chick. That's about all I can tell. I didn't even know that. How did you know that? There's pictures. There are pictures on there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> did you? I don't know. I guess I must have blanked that part yeah, out. Yeah, there's, there's there's a guy and a chick. Out okay. And uh, another thing that was weird is there's a credit counter. It says credits one. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if this is, you know, from the time period where people are still trying to get that arcade experience at home and they, they just put that in there. But I thought that was that was interesting. Well, if you, if, you know, it, when you put your initials in, you can use the joystick, you know, mm -hmm. sort of the same right. kind of deal. Right. So they were going for And it is very arcade. -y. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, which I'll get into in a moment. It's really arcade. -y. Um, The controls, you, you have the option of using the mouse. I don't know why you'd want to. Is there <laughs> any strategic reason you'd want to use the mouse for you know, I don't think I've ever tried using a mouse. But now the Amiga, they had a two-button mouse, right? That's right, out of the gate. So yeah, um, it'd be interesting to know how the uh, you know if the ship separation thing that we'll get into later, if that that was the second mouse. Maybe button it was or easier what. on the. Uh, maybe you could you know do the thing. That's the, true. That's true. Um, <clears throat> the soundtrack I thought was excellent. Oh yeah, great, uh, great, memorable. Yeah, I mean the uh, there's a great kind of ripping guitar solo as you you know you head out over the desert uh one of the things that i thought was funny is that the gun and some of the guitar solo appear to be on the same audio channel yeah well it's for it's for channel audio uh, i'm guessing that they used i'm not sure how they did it but I, yeah it's funny when you shoot stuff you'll some of the soundtrack goes away mm -hmm. I, i've heard that in other games yeah yeah it just, it's limitations of the uh right but still you know some games let you turn the soundtrack off and and, uh, and and so you could have full sound, and some games have a soundtrack, and there's no nothing but the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a good uh, middle of the road. One of the things I really liked was that when you died and you come back, you know, the ship drops you off again, and it goes, yeah. you know, when you come back, and it gets you all pumped up to go back in there. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed about the scoring, at least, you know, I'm playing this on an emulator on an original Xbox, but uh, my score was messed up. Um, the score on the left, the last two zeros of the score are dropped. So, you know, it says, I think the, the, the top score when you start the game is like 50,000. And I'm shooting stuff and I'm getting one, two, three points. In reality, I'm getting one or two or 300 points. But uh, did that happen to you on your version? No, I'm, I'm playing on a, uh, an Amiga 12, 1200, and uh, it was all straight up money. So that, that's probably something to do with the uh, emulation. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but once I once I figured that out, I realized that it would be possible to uh, surpass the high score. It's too bad that you figured that out. I would have just crushed you. <laughs> yeah, I'd humiliate you. <laughs> so, um, but uh, anyway, what are your what are your thoughts on this? this well, game? I'll tell you, I love I love Hybris. Uh, I'm not a big fan of shooters, 
But I thought this was just an awesome game. Still is. It, it held up. I thought it held up great. I remember uh, the first time I had I had an apartment uh, in college, and I had a friend of mine who was a, just a devout PC follower. When I got an Amiga, he was he was appalled at the at the thought that I'd get something that wasn't a PC. He looked at Amigas like like a, he would look at an Apple and think it's just garbage. And uh, I had him over one night, and I said, "Listen, I'm gonna I'm you know why don't you sit down and try this game." He didn't want to do it. I was like, listen, it's a shooter. You love shooters. He sat down. And uh, he started playing it. And he played it. And he played it. Finally, I went to bed. And I woke up the next morning. He was still sitting there playing. His eyes were bloodshot. There were tears streaming down his face. And he goes, he turned to me as I walked in the room. He says, I want to buy your Amiga. <laughs> I was like, sorry, pal. You're on your own. But uh, uh, so we got his seal of approval. But it's a great game. I like uh, everything about it. The music. I even like the little transitions when you die. The, the, it's kind of every little square on the screen sort of spirals mm-hmm, around, which is mm-hmm. a, it's a neat effect. Uh, the uh, the power-up system's awesome. It's deep. The expansion of your ship, uh, awesome. That's an awesome uh, gimmick. Smart Bomb, awesome. Being able to do that stuff from the joystick's awesome. Having a keyboard, that's the way I did it, because I never could spin it. I would sometimes do it accidentally. It used to drive me nuts. Um the uh, the boss battles were neat. I thought it was cool that the bosses would you'd fight one and it would sort of leave, mm-hmm. and you had to go further down the line to to, to go get him. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> the uh, I read something and it, I never read this before, and it's, maybe this is old news, and maybe you know about it. But uh, someone had mentioned a game called UFO Robo Dangar. Have you heard of this game? Not, not familiar with it. It also is known as Dangar UFO Robo. <laughs> but on the marquee, it says, it's just an arc, it's a coin-op machine. Uh-huh. And I, and they said, yeah, Hyrus is a total rip-off of this. And I was like, what? And I went and had a look at this thing. Mm-hmm. Hyrus is at least a partial rip-off of this. <laughs> this, well, this. This game was eerily similar in, in scrolling background. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of it looked exactly the same. I mean, exactly. Now, in in in, in Dangar, you are you start off with like this robot that flies as a shoot 'em up, and he gets extra parts that mm-hmm. make him into a ship. You know what I mean? He gets bigger and bigger, so that that part's the same. Uh, I just watched a little bit of Dangar, about fifteen minutes of it, but it was it, the water, everything. It looked it was very similar. So that's something to check out. I, I'm guessing that there's no coincidence. Right, right. Well, you know, back in those days, especially. You know, with their three-man development team, I'm sure it was uh, people didn't people didn't complain too much when you borrowed things from, well, from point off games. The funny thing about it is, is that Dangar came out the year before, mm-hmm. but the uh, but Hyrus looks and sounds much better. Really, and that's at home, which is right. that's a something to think about. Oh yeah, and I'm guessing that Dangar didn't have a lot of. I mean, I I never heard of it, and I you know I'm a coin op guy, mm-hmm. so. It must be a pretty rare item. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, it's the one of the things that I didn't like about this game is the the power up system. Uh, sometimes doesn't do anything for you. Like, say that you're you've got your level one power up, the power up you start up with, you get shot at the same time while the level two power up is on the board. You can't pick up that level two power up. Yeah, it won't let you, you pick have, it up. You have to be and, on the run. And to me, that's like in Mario. If you're a small Mario and you get a fire flower, and it wouldn't let you pick it, it would just it would it just made me mad to no end because I got screwed by that so many times. Well, the uh, and and some of the power ups I don't like. It's a lot like Alcon. Sometimes you'll get a power up and it's an advance in the power, but the new power I don't like that much. Right. And in this one, it's those kind of lasery electrical lasery things that would come off the ship after you got up that high. Now are there are there only three levels? I never saw anything past the third level of a power up. I don't you know, I never really paid attention to how far I got it. There may be four. Mm-hmm. Maybe there is four. I'm not one hundred percent sure. Uh I, I I'm not sure I could survive long enough to get to the four. Yeah. <laughs> it might be that. Yeah. And you know Overall, you know, I really like this game a lot, especially, you know, in hindsight, knowing that a 16 year old kid made it, you know, uh, it's just incredible. The the only really weird enemy thing I thought was the way that the bosses kind of shim, shimmy across the screen. You know, the rest of the enemies, their movement is real fluid and real nice. But then, you know, you, you this boss comes out doing some sort of soft shoe routine and he's just kind of shimmying across the, the it, it, it doesn't really look menacing. You know, the boss, do they do kind of, uh, I don't know, sashay back and right. forth. 
at the top of the screen. I, I agree. The uh, really the, my biggest grace with the game, and I, I mean, there's a, I like a lot of stuff about it. I like the hidden power ups. I like the splitting of the ship. I like the power bombs. I like a lot, almost everything. The uh, the alien, the ships that would come in from off screen, the pattern ships, they were smooth, but they, I kind of like the more of a Galaga formation type stuff, where they would spin around. They don't now on later levels, they do a little more of that, but it, for the most part, they're just kind of pattern. They kind of fly on. I wish those were a little more intricate, uh, and their ships, they don't look like ships. They just look like sometimes they just look like weird little shapes. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of Blood Money. It does the same thing with this bad guy to just kind of wander in and they on these patterns. But uh, uh, overall, I mean, that's a minor gripe. And, they, and even those are neat. I mean, I like the fact that you shoot a bunch of them, you get extra points, which mm -hmm. is cool. Uh, I like the uh, smart bombs that those guys on the road shoot at. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are neat. In uh, fact, I thought that the way that those those things kind of roll in, they look more impressive than the bosses. Yeah, and they would they, even sort of roll off screen right, and come back around, right. which made it really tough. Uh, I always, one thing I always wondered is if uh, uh, why the uh, why the space station is just dropping this little ship off. And it's this huge <laughs> yeah. why machine can't the space of doom. Station, yeah. you know, <laughs> help out a little bit. Yeah, no kidding. Um, you know, they, one of the things that we didn't mention before for people that aren't familiar with the Amiga is that uh, one of the things that makes playing Amiga games a little bit awkward as someone that didn't grow up with them is the fact that there's only one button on the controller. So a lot of times developers had to do kind of funny things to take advantage of a secondary weapon where that second button would be. So uh, like Aaron was saying, to activate the smart bomb, you actually have to hold in the button and then rotate the stick uh, 360 degrees. And uh, so that's, you know, that's not an easy thing to do in the heat of battle sometimes when you're trying to fend off a bunch of enemies. And that I think that's one of the things that, you know, now eventually... Did any Amiga joysticks... You said that some games ended up with two-button support, right? Yeah, well, some eventually they had support. A lot of people were taking Genesis controllers and hook them into the Amiga. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a way you could get, do a little dongle and get an extra button on that. So they're, the, these are the, the Amiga joysticks are just a 9-pin... They're straight-up like Atari. Atari. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I use an Atari Wiko uh, uh, on mine, mm -hmm. and I've used it since I've had this thing as long as I've been in the Amiga. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can hook an Atari joystick up to it. But uh, um, eventually, the CD32 came out. It had multiple buttons. Uh, so some games, like I can play some of the games on the CD32, and they'll they'll have multiple buttons for it if you have a setup to accommodate multiple buttons. But most games, I'd say the over overwhelming uh, bunch of games, probably ninety percent, are just one button games. And sometimes they would put, like in Hyrus's case, they would put some controllers on the keyboard if you needed them. But they came up with the you know cunning way of having to spin the joystick in a certain direction and have things happen, which is a good idea. Right. Uh, as long as you didn't do it accidentally, which I used to do it all the time. <laughs> I remember the first time I did it, and I was like, "What the heck was that?" I yeah. There were smart bombs in yeah. the game. Yeah. Um. Another thing I thought was weird is that you can only split your ship a limited amount of times, and those times are timed. Yeah. You know, so you might get forty-five seconds. I don't know how long, but you get a certain amount of time before your ships come back. And uh, I'm not saying I, I like it or dislike it, but it's not something that, uh, you know, the whole mechanic is just kind of, it's unique. Well, I think, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that the way that works is, you know, every once in a while you'll hit something and it'll shoot this, start this thing going back and forth across mm -hmm, the screen. Yep. And, you, and if you touch, it goes, barrel, makes this weird noise. Mm -hmm. And I assume that that's... And the more you hit that, those, the longer you can be split. Oh, okay. And I, I didn't, I had no idea what that thing, that ping pong ball thing was. Yeah, so. but I mean, did you ever get hit oh, by it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's a good thing. I think that's how you build the charge up for the length of time that, or the amount of time right. to do that. Okay. Uh, I don't, again, I, I, I don't know. And I, I looked at the manual and tried to find some information about that. And I, I don't know, maybe people, maybe somebody could write in and say, yes, that's exactly what that was. But I, right. So if you, if you know, leave us some feedback, uh, on a Facebook page, or you can leave a, uh, a comment on the blog. Um, now, I did watch a Let's Play for this, just because I wanted to see somebody that really knew what they were doing. Right. And it's possible to complete this game in just about 30 minutes. Yeah, I watched, I watched, uh, I, I've never completed it. I've seen it completed. Uh, the uh, The last level gets pretty funky. Uh, yeah, it looks like you're, uh, you're in the desert, then you're over the ocean. That was where I bowed out. Uh, then it looks like you're kind of, there's this kind of organic material. Yeah, like and, a, it's almost like a uh, 
a <laughs> bloodstream or right, something. Right, right. It was weird. It was weird. weird. And then you you leave that at the very last minute to fight the last guy in space. I was disappointed um, in the in the last guy. Um, yeah. He. I mean, he just. I don't want to give away any secrets, but I mean, there's not much to give away. Just the last guy, duh. But he he looks different, but he it's still sort of a big kind of lumbering thing that. It must be hard, you know. It just must be hard to code. You know, special boss movements or something. You know, it, yeah, I mean, he had a lot more bullets and stuff. Mm-hmm. I like that he he actually shot other ships. That was kind of neat, right? You know, but uh, but he I mean, he was better than the other bosses, but just by a thread. He looked like something out of Zevi. That's <laughs> what he looked like. Now, let me ask you this: uh, I was reading an article on OldGames.com, and they were talking about there's a customized game option in this game. Have you seen that before? It says the number and regularity of the enemy's bombs can be changed. As can the frequency and duration of the expansion. Well, there's a, there's a couple there's a couple of gimmicks. All right, one thing on the on the title screen, when you go to select your pilot, mm-hmm. if you hit the space bar, did you do that? No, because I don't have one. Okay, well, it, it, you've got an emulated <laughs> keyboard on the Xbox. Oh yeah, that's true. So anyway, if you hit the space bar, you get an options menu. You can get change the number of guys you get. You can change, really... you can change how quick they move. Mm-hmm. That sort of thing. That must be what this. And is And then well, about. there's another thing you can do, which I haven't done this, but I, I read about it. You can on the uh, when the top 10 scores screen comes up, or how many, I think it's more mm-hmm. than 10. If you just, and this is not when you're entering your score, this is just when it comes up during like just the demo mode. mode yeah. Type in Commander. Mm-hmm. If you do that, you'll have access to a special oh. hat cheat screen. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Which Alex, and I, that I haven't tried the space bar. And, and uh, of course, I, and full disclosure, this was a game from Europe that I'd never bought. It was one I got I got through nefarious means, you know, nineteen eighty nine or whatever. So we had I had no uh, instructions. So I actually got the file. I sat down and read the instructions, and I pretty much knew what <laughs> there wasn't much to read. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's there's not a whole lot of the backstory. Involved. That's about the, yeah. the backstory has there's no resemblance to the game. Um. So. Uh... The, uh, there were a couple of Amiga magazines that reviewed this when it came out, and they gave it pretty positive reviews. You know, they, nobody gave it a perfect score, but Amiga Computing in January 1989 gave it a 91%. And uh, there was a magazine called The One for 16-Bit Games, and in March 1989, they gave it an 88%. So, pretty good reviews. Pretty good reviews. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a, a, I think it's a, a top 20 game, in my opinion. You know, now, I'm not a, a shooter aficionado. But it's pretty. It sounds nice. Mm-hmm. It's not ridiculously hard. Right, right, right. The challenge, you know, I definitely didn't get you know crazy far into it, but I never felt overwhelmed. Two player simultaneous play would have put it over the top. Oh yeah, that yeah. would have been that would have been like you know deluxe got Galaga style mm-hmm. two player at once. That would have been awesome. And then the last little bit of news I have is that uh, there is a new version of Hybris coming out <laughs> yeah, for iOS that. and Android, where everything comes out these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's sometime slated for release sometime in 2015. Uh, there's been no exact date, uh, and uh, so they've still got you know half a year to make it happen. So, but be on the lookout. I put a link in the show notes for that. Uh, Cope-com.com. Weird. Slash hybris. So um, that is coming up. I think it's a good choice, too. I mean, hey, the game's old, but it, it plays it's smooth as silk. It plays well. I don't think there's a whole lot that needs to be done. They should just, you know, do whatever it takes to play it. I mean, I'm sure you can emulate it on the Android now, but it's an excellent game. Right. It's an excellent choice. It, I'm sure they can add online leaderboards and things like that. Well, it would be them. nice if they would just add a few, like, Simultaneous two player would be awesome, especially if you could play simultaneous two player with someone that's, you know, just on your phone. <laughs> so yeah. that would be great. Yeah. So um, that's Hybris. It's time to move on to the most important part of the podcast the scores. So, Aaron, what was your top score? I will say that I, I've played this game for years. I've never been that good at it. All right. Uh, and I usually I'll just continue and continue until I just say I can't get any further. But I was on, on one quarter, as it were. <laughs> Uh, I had the best game I've ever had of it, for what that's worth. I got 320,900. Wow, that is very impressive. That is more than double my high score. <laughs> oh, wow. I got 158,325. Wow, what happened? So, well, that was actually one of my better times. Did you, just, did, you, how, did you get to the second level? I did get to the second level. I did not stay long. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I played what I thought was a pretty good game. It just wasn't good enough. Well, to be fair, I have a few decades on you <laughs> when it comes to this particular game. Now, I'll, I'll freely admit, when it comes to Amiga games, this is one of my better games, I guess, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, it's what I've played a lot over the years. Uh, it's, it's, a, and it's an awesome game, and when you get the feel of how to use that expansion of your ship, when they hit the, uh, the the big boom buttons, mm-hmm. I do get... have a problem in uh, shoot 'em ups with uh, regulating the use of the smart bomb. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I frequently die without using any of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so oh no, so you're, you're super thrifty oh, when it comes right, to using them. Right. Yeah, you gotta gotta let them go. You get them back quick though, usually in this game. So. Right, right. So, but anyway, that's Hybris, uh, and that's the end of our first episode. Uh, you can leave us feedback. At the Facebook page, uh, we've got a Facebook page. We've also got a blog at Amigos.com. Or no, that's not right. Amigospodcast.com. Close. Um, and uh, that will redirect you to our blogger site that's got links to all the things we talked about and uh, also recordings. Uh, we are in the process of getting approved on iTunes. I expect that to happen by the time you listen to this. And uh, Or if you want to just download the episodes, you can do that from the blog, or you can stream them uh, also from the blog. So, uh, from here in... Oh, I didn't even tell you where we were recording from. We were recording from scenic, beautiful Hurricane, West Virginia, in my, in my basement. So beautiful. It is. It's scenic. It's wonderful. Uh, so, from Hurricane, West Virginia, and this is uh, John Schaller. And Aaron. Uh, signing off. See you Adios. next time.